This is The Culture. What is going on, Cinema Wave fans? I am your host today, Zach Miller, and we are going to be talking about the indie spotlight featured Eileen featuring Anne Hathaway and Thomason McKenzie. This is a 1960s period piece that sets place, takes place in coastal Massachusetts. It is in, uh, sorry, <laughs> not Boston. It, it's in just the coastal Massachusetts town. It follows two young women. Um, Eileen is played by Thomas and McKenzie. She is working at a juvenile detention facility. And Anne Hathaway is the ravishing young counselor that comes in from New York. And there is a little bit of mystery behind her role and what it plays in the story. So this movie, I just saw this at the Montclair Film Festival. The film festival has been a great experience for all of us here at Cinema Wave. They were super um, gracious in granting us a lot of passes, a lot of access to the festival. They really overdid themselves on um, just giving us a great experience to in experience a lot of indie films, a lot of showcases that really just niched a lot of artists together in the community. And Montclair is such a rich filmmaker community. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in some of our other podcasts on the full festival, but the experience was great. I got to see it. It was their closing night film and it was a great film to just wrap it up on. Anne Hathaway, of course, is from New Jersey. If anyone didn't know, she's a famous, she's famous for her start at the Paper Mill Playhouse and she's always bounced around in New Jersey. There was a lot of people taking pictures with her when they were filming this. And what the producer of the film was also saying was that it was a challenge, of course, to do a low budget feature about um, Massachusetts in the 1960s and then putting that in New Jersey. So they had some hurdles to jump over, but I thought they did a great job at just showcasing their abilities as a production and as a unit for just encompassing the 1960s and delivering a good story. So just to do a recap of the plot, if anyone is not aware, the plot is written as such. The stagnant waters of Eileen's dull, stifled life as a solitary worker at a juvenile detention center in the 1960s Boston are unexpectedly unexpectedly disrupted when the institution brings in a new psychologist, the vibrant Rebecca. The fervent enthusiasm that blossoms between the two women almost immediately gives way to a closer relationship until their fragile connection takes a dramatic turn. So the producer, just to start off, the producer described this as very... Hitchcockian, which I can definitely see that translating to a lot of people. It's got a lot of neo-noir. It was made as a neo-noir. There's a lot of mystery to Anne Hathaway's character and her origins. She comes into the fold as this prison counselor from New York. So she's already a fish out of water. The workplace environment is in the 1960s. It was very male dominated. And they're obviously looking at her, gawking at her, really reducing her accomplishments. She was graduated from Harvard in the story, and she's obviously taking headway at in, in incorporating herself into the um, prison institution that they're at. So I think that it was really interesting to see this Hitchcockian portrayal of a new modern take on a mystery and a thriller like that. And I think that the mystery that they gave to her character just always perks your ears up whenever you're going into a neo-noir or you're doing something where it's like a thriller and you're being fed clues the whole time. You're honestly on the edge of your seat, less for the action, but more for the details. And I think that was something they really achieved well here. So she was great in the in the film. Anne Hathaway, I mean, I will go see anything that she's in always, I promise. And um, 
Thomas and Mackenzie, I actually felt with her work in the past, I was definitely impressed with Jojo Rabbit. I was impressed with Last Night in Soho, which I watched not too long ago. I think that she's definitely evolved as an actress. I honestly haven't been the biggest fan of her until this movie. I think that she does good work. I don't think she does great work yet, but I think it's starting to come into the fold with this movie because she's she really had to jump into a role that is, you know, it's in a period piece and it's in Boston. She did a great Boston accent. She had to do a lot of study on the backstory with the abuse with her father. There's very detached relationships that she is diving through in this entire film. She has a lot of perspective that she has been abandoned by so many people. Her father is the biggest culprit for that. And I think that she's deprived of many things. She de She's deprived sexually. She always is gazing at couples, whether they're making out in cars or she even fantasizes about situations with other men in the workplace. And then she's always wanting a deeper connection. She can't go out anywhere. She's literally living in the attic. Her father basically resents her and completely deprives her of any social norm of that time where she is just going to work. She has no friends. She's 24 in the story, I believe. And she's basically living a pretty miserable life. So it's, it's really interesting when Rebecca comes into the fold, there's a stark juxt juxtaposition between them, the two of them. And a lot of that is portrayed through the use of color. Anne Hathaway drives in her first scene in this uh, red Cadillac. I think it's a Cadillac. I'm not really sure. I'm a big car guy, but I can't really tell what that specific car was. But it was a it's a big red um, wagon and not wagon. <laughs> I'm doing more car rambling than any movie rambling at this point. But it's a it's a car. It's a red car. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. But it's trying to stick out. That's what the filmmaker is trying to say to us that this woman sticks out. She's in a very colorful dress. She's in a very um, provocative outfit or and she has so like perfect blonde hair and it's very separate from everyone else in the workplace so the filmmakers are obviously trying to say that this is a woman that eileen holds up to as a role model she's accomplished she's um confident she's full of life and she's she just carries this energy to her that eileen has been itching to find so immediately we as the audience and Eileen are drawn to this um, enchanting nature about Anne Hathaway. So I thought that was a great juxtaposition. And um, there are a lot of, honestly, the, the biggest part of the movie, I would say three quarters of the movie is about this back and forth between Eileen's morality, her character, um, how, things are just wearing her down and trying to break her psychology. And um, I think that is the best thing that the filmmakers achieve is they really focus in on how many times can we wear this person down and how many things have to happen before she snaps. And her snapping is part of what happens with the climax of the film, which I'll get into later. Um, so I think going back to what I was saying about Hitchcock movies, there's a lot of great Hitchcock movies like Rear Window, um, North by Northwest, even Psycho. These are very normal people, so to speak. In Rear Window, he's simply a photographer and he has a broken leg. To other movies, that is a pretty boring character, but it's about the situation that he observes and that in Hitchcock movies, it's a lot of people living ordinary lives and one character or many characters 
might disrupt that lifestyle or a situation might disrupt that lifestyle. So Eileen is thrust into the fold where she is living this very mundane, boring um, lifestyle that she just no longer wants to be a part of. She's like Anne Hathaway is bringing all this energy to her. I, and she's the one person that's actually noticed me in work and someone that might actually want to be with me for the first time ever. Um, so to go off of that, I'm going to go into some spoilers. And if you haven't seen the movie, which it probably won't be out for a while until this is posted. If you haven't seen the movie, this is your point to turn it off. I hope you enjoyed that first um, bridge to get to the spoilers. But that was my pre non spoiler review. This is my spoiler take. So this is like, dude, thriller stuff. You don't want spoiled. So just turn it off. Turn it off right now. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. This is another huge part of the movie, which I thought they did great. So um, there's a big part of Anne and Thomason's sexuality coming into play. Um, earlier in the movie, <clears throat> there are scenes where Eileen is uh, masturbating as she's watching two other people engage in um just making out and she's obviously feeling very deprived sexually where she has no connection with someone on just a social level let alone a sexual level and an intimate level so there is one scene where Anne Hathaway invites her out for a co-worker drink and she gets dressed up very well she is honestly not really expecting much out of this except for this is a nice friend that is finally noticing me. They go out to dinner or they, they go out to, for drinks at this local pub. And there's these men that start to um, gawk at them and almost catcalling them where they're just trying to, um, you know, dismiss them and, and not, not entertain any of their ideas. And then she starts dancing. The two of them start dancing. And another man, this, one of the same men, starts to come over to her and grab her. And then Anne Hathaway completely clubs the one guy and um, basically stands up for Eileen and herself at the same time. And this is like super provocative for Eileen. No one's ever stood up for her in one sense as well as just shown men that they cannot be these domineering force uh, forces in the workplace and throughout her life because that's all she's ever known and when she sees rebecca club a guy with her elbow that was like an incredible turn on which i don't even think she realized she had it she had deep down inside her so she begins to slow dance with her after that and you can see there's this like beautiful embrace where she finally feels safe with this person. And it, it's not even just about a fixation on a sexual level. It's more of just a, oh my gosh, this is someone who, who's finally there for me. This is someone who can finally appreciate what I represent and then you know just wants to be with me. She, all she's ever known, again, is, is just to be abandoned by society, by her family, by her workplace. So when someone finally stands up for her in that moment, she feels completely at ease. So after they leave the bar, there is another scene that follows up with, um, they stand outside and Hathaway is a little drunk. She's had probably too much to drink. And there's a lot of staring between the two of them. There's a very deep level of connection that's obviously being had more so on Eileen's perspective. And then Anne Hathaway goes in and she kisses her on the lips. And I don't know if that was intentional wholeheartedly because she was drunk. And Eileen is also not aware of that. But there is more of a, oh my gosh, maybe she feels the same way about me or about this relationship. That, and in that moment, she's really trying to figure that out. Um, so that plays hard into the next um, 
phases of the story. Then there's another great scene, which really stood out to me, is when um, this is another scene that really showcases Thomason's abilities as well. So the following morning, she wakes up in basically a puddle of her own vomit on the car seat. She almost crashed the car into her house. This is the first night that she's ever been out. And then she comes inside. Her dad is really mad at her. He took the keys away from her. And she's like, I have to go to work. I have to do this. I, she's finally confident in herself after a night out with somebody who just showed her her potential, basically. And there's a great um, dialogue between her and her father. He is just completely off the walls, abusive to her and toxic. And he just basically puts her down, says all kinds of nasty things, diminishing her to a minuscule person. And she is not having it. And I think her range comes out really well there. I think that she really goes at him with a lot more emotion than I've seen her do in other movies. And I was pretty impressed with um, how she can break out into this confident role. Um, and that was part of the arc. That was about probably the midpoint with her arc, at least. Maybe not the movie, but definitely her arc. So that was a great scene. I'm interested to hear if anyone else thought that same scene was good. But then, okay, so now we're going to get into... There's There's a lot that happens before this. So let me just do a setup for the climax because I want to get into the climax and what happens with the details. There's a lot of different things that um, I want to touch up on, but I got to give you some context on it. So earlier in the movie, there is a dialogue between Anne Hathaway and one of the troubled detention center inmates who is a boy. His name is, I think, James Polk, um, but he's a younger man and his mother goes in to visit. Eileen is observing through the window, but we don't hear the dialogue as a sound choice in the movie. And you um, are left out of that conversation. There's something mysterious about the conversation and what is being said, but we don't understand until later that um, there's a reason for that. And Anne Hathaway is on her own time digging for what those reasons are. And um, the mother storms out of that conversation with the three of them she's she gets out of the room she's like i can't believe you would ask this um and that's all we know up to that point so when <clears throat> excuse me so when there's a big part of the climax that comes around it comes back to the polks and this is something that we were not expecting there is uh, this is the major twist of the movie, and this is where the thrilling elements come into play. So with about 20 to 30 minutes left in the movie, Anne Hathaway reveals to Eileen that she has kidnapped and tied up Mrs. Polk in the basement of her own house. She also reveals to her that this is not her house, but this is Mrs. Polk's house. And she ties her up in the basement she says, I need you to help me with this. We have to get this confession out of her. I think something happened to the boy and we have to get him off because he murdered his father and I think there's a reason for that. So they both go down in the basement. Um, there is an intense conversation. Matt, like this is definitely what I think is the best part of the movie and I think a lot of people would agree. So they go down in the basement um, she's tied out, she's tied up and she's really pleading. She's like, you're not going to get away with this. Um, you can't do this to me. And Anne Hathaway is really trying to milk it out of her that there's a problem and a reason that the boy of, uh, Mrs. Polk would go and kill his father. Um, so she confides in the two of them. And she says, yes, there was a reason he was sexually abused and his father would, um, would basically abuse him. And then she would, he would come back into 
Mrs. Polk's bedroom and he would be better than ever. And Mrs. Polk basically describes that she would let it go on because her intimate life was dwindling. And this was a, in a really messed up way, rekindling of their intimacy. So she let it happen. And then at some point off screen, the boy snapped, killed his father. And that's where we're back at with this conversation. And she, so basically Rebecca needed Eileen for this confession and she needed another person there. Um, but to get that out of her, Eileen pulls her father's gun on her. She's really putting it in her face. Um, this was a huge scene that honestly, with those two actresses there, the third actress, Marin Ireland, who is also familiar with, or has been in um, The Irishman, Hell or High Water, Revolutionary Road, she stole the scene for me, absolutely, there, by far. I mean, she gave a gut-wrenching performance. She's literally pleading for her life. She stole every scene that she was in, frankly, for me, and she's really not in this movie as much because it's it's probably better that way for the story's sake because you're not suspecting her as a problem for the story. So I respected that, but I think that she was very deserving of more screen time. So she did a great job with what she had in the material. And um, you could just tell that deep down through her performance that there was this trauma that she let go on and her marriage was also so fractured and so um, painful that she was just trying to get through it by any means necessary. And that was horrible behavior that she lets um that she let go on and i think that she really felt that guilt in that moment too that she really wanted to be better for her son and it's all coming out when you have a gun in your face right like you're obviously going through all your regrets all your decisions and um eileen has also been very worn down to this point she has such a horrible relationship with her father that she um, she doesn't have a respect for authority or her family or a father or mother figure. So there is a lot of conversation where the woman is very dismissive of her. What would you understand? You're just a young girl. You don't get how marriage works because you're so young and you're so new to situations like this, you wouldn't understand like you weren't there. Those types of conversations. And Eileen just completely snaps. And she shoots her in the shoulder. And Hathaway runs over. Um, she says, Eileen, why would you shoot her in the shoulder? And then she grabs a bottle of pills, stuffs it down her throat, and um, they basically kill her with an overdose. And now... Anne Hathaway is frantic. She was phenomenal in this scene as well. And I thought that this was the major transition for Eileen. This was, she's now in a red dress as well. And this is to further emphasize that um, callback to a flashy, energetic persona. She has finally arrived into her new skin where she feels comfortable that she is fully confident and fully taken over by this aura that she now embodies and as messed up as it is she feels like she finally has full say in the decisions that she has in her life and i think that was really good um the that whole scene was great and um i know if you've seen the movie you've probably seen all these events play out but i, I think it's just important to give more context to emphasize some points so i think that when, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the couple scenes that come after too, I personally felt were a letdown. And I think that this movie was really, really good up until this point. There is a lot that could have been explored after this. Um, right after <clears throat> the overdose happens, they come up with a plan. Eileen is going to frame her father and put uh, Mrs. Polk in the car, put her somewhere, and then it'll look like her father did the murder with his gun. And 
there's other details that happen earlier in the film to set up for that. So I won't go over those again, but there was a missed opportunity because then she's like, Anne Hathaway, <laughs> can we like, we can run away together. I love you. And Hathaway doesn't necessarily say anything with that, except the emotion in her eyes. She's a little hesitant to give her and I love you back. And she doesn't. And, but she says, I'm going to go clean this up. I'll meet you. And then by the end, um, and Hathaway does not come. And for Eileen, this is now, okay, everyone that I've ever trusted has abandoned me. So I'm going to get on a truck and I'm going to leave. And I understand the reason that the filmmaker chose to go that route is now she's free, like so to speak. But to be completely honest, there was nothing holding that version of the ending back the entire movie. She has, in what my mind is, a miserable life from the beginning. If you really wanted to leave home, you would do that from the start. You would get on a truck or a bus at the beginning without any of this happening and go somewhere else because your father's a bastard. He doesn't care about what you do. He has no interest in nurturing a relationship with you. He really just doesn't want anything good for you. And then your workplace is full of uh, domineering men trying to completely put you in your place. Even the only two women there are dismissive of you as well, um, undervaluing you. So there was nothing that could hold her back before then. It was kind of just like the, the entire plot was building to this point. <clears throat> and um, that there was a balloon full of all these great elements. The climax has finally arrived at this point and then the ending it just completely bursted. The, the rug was swept out from under us and we were left with not much closure of what could come next. And I think with thrillers, this is the stuff that we want to see. What comes next? Because you have two ordinary people that are not psychopaths. They've just been thrown into the situation. This is a snowballing situation where they didn't intend to kill this woman, but now they had to. Um, because she knows too much. So what is this going to do to affect both of these women's psychologies? And clearly it's affected Eileen more where she feels empowered in a weird way. Rebecca is a little bit more frantic and, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So for it to just end and feel truncated where there was no... Um, there was no expansion on what happened at the end. We understand that Eileen is free. We don't know exactly where Anne Hathaway went by the end. I'm assuming that she is also going to skip town because she has a lot going back to her as well. But it, it, it left no room to expand on what was there. And I think that those effects of how this affected somebody and then also... It's a thriller, so you would expect there to be a police chase. There's a bullet in this woman's shoulder. They're going to eventually figure something out there. That's a little puzzling. Why did she shoot herself in the shoulder and then take opioids? There's a lot of other questions from a story standpoint that, okay, where is this going to go? There's a couple more rabbit holes that I felt that the film could have dived down, but it didn't. And I think that it was a really good piece at being character driven. I think it definitely nailed that Hitchcock feel, but the resolution was not exactly there. And I think that for it to wrap up as quickly as it did, it definitely suffered for that. But I think up to that point, it was a great film. And I think these two young ladies do a great job at showcasing their abilities. I thought the script was actually really good up until that point too. It just felt like it ran out of gas. And sometimes that happens, but it was already an hour and 30 minutes. I think if it had another 30 minutes or a little less than 30 minutes, it would have given another point where, oh man, we have to get out of the situation. We don't know how, because there was a lot of a thrill ride leading to that point. And then it happens and it just ends. And I think that really leaves a lot of thrillers from meeting that great expectation. And, and it sits at like a good expectation. So, 
that's kind of my take on the film as a whole, um, especially the ending. I I didn't hate this movie. I thought it was a good movie. I think if you're a big fan of the thriller genre like I am, it's worth a watch. Um, like I said, anything Anne Hathaway is in is great. And I think Thomas and Mackenzie is really beginning to come into her own come into her own as a young performer. And I hope that she gets more roles like this in a script. And you know, I think it's it's a movie that might get brushed under the rug this year just because of how star studded a lineup of films and actors it has been for this year. But I think if it was in any other year it might get more recognition. So I hope it does get some recognition. I thought the production design was fantastic. I'm a big art department junkie, um, but they did an amazing job at recreating the feel of the 60s without overdoing it. There's there's no over glamorous, exaggerated moments where you're taken out of it. And it just feels like this very dreary coastal Massachusetts in the 1960s. So I really appreciated that um and what they did with that but yeah this is a great movie i good uh, well i'll say i'll say good movie not a great movie for me i thought it was still like a four out of five stars for me i think it was just that ending where it missed a little bit and um it was thoroughly entertaining but like i said if you're a thriller junkie like me check it out um it's definitely worth it and I'm assuming if you got to this point in the podcast, you have already checked it out and you have heard this information. But um, yeah, I just want to give another shout out to the Montclair Film Festival. The festival was just really great at organizing such a versatile bunch of films. We had an awesome time going. Um, they, they really helped us out with trying to get us passes and seeing the right type of content. So... We all saw a great bunch of films. There will be more information on <clears throat> the Montclair Film Festival coming soon. And if you are interested in any more of our podcasts, be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Spotify, Apple Music, Instagram at Cinema Wave Media, and then also follow us at Culture Wave Media on Instagram. We have TikTok, we have YouTube. We are getting up and ready and we are mobilizing we are getting bigger guys so we just need your help and we need to help you and we need you no we're not helping you you we need you to help us build our our following and um we really appreciate you guys turning in and thank you for listening to this interview of eileen and i am zach miller one last time and this is the cinema wave podcast we'll catch you next time